like Mama Cornette told me, Jimmy, take care of that. It may be worth some money one of these days. That's why I have a 53-year-old slinky that still is fully functioning to this day and can go up and down the stairs. Well, he can't go up the stairs. That'd be asking too much. You just said something really interesting because I always... You know, you've always talked on the show and you've always talked in general about the fact that your mom embraced anything that you were really interested in, but you never really said before, did she actually say to you it would be worth money one day? Oh my God. That, yes. About everything. My mother, she was born, she was born in a log cabin. No, she was born. <laughs> no, this is serious. She was born in a, a home without indoor plumbing or running water in Eastern Kentucky in the depths of the Great Depression when Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president and told us the only thing we had to fear was fear itself. Well, they had to fear wild animals and starvation. So uh, as she grew older, she was still careful with her money, finances, things. When, when, when we cleaned out the house after she passed away, she had saved. And I mean, it's not like she was living on, you know, I was about to say borrowed time, but not like she was living on pennies, right? She had saved three or four little soap boxes full of soap slivers, just in case, didn't want to throw the soap sliver away, just in case it ever might be necessary, right? So everything that I ever had, it was prefaced with, now take care of that, or it might be worth something someday, or both. That's why I saved everything I've ever fucking had almost and regret some of the things I've turned loose up. Because in most cases, it's the kid kept something thinking it could be worth something one day. And the parent is like, oh, get rid of it. Or you hear stories like, oh, the parent threw away the box of baseball cards or the old comics. No, no, no. It's one thing letting you keep it. It's another thing. The actual embracing of the idea could be worth something one day. That's amazing. Well, no, but I was, I was keeping her up to date on the comic books with the annual Action Comics number one call. So she knew the comic books were worth money. And what was the I, annual call? What do you mean? I've told you this story. When I had the chance from Howard Rogofsky in New York, who later became friends with handsome Jimmy Valiant, to buy a copy of Action Comics number one for $400 in 1970. And in, I don't know what the, I don't have the inflation calculator in front of me, but. Let's figure that that $400 today would be like $2,500 for Action Comics number one, the first Superman, mail order catalog. I actually talked, met and talked to Howard Rogofsky about this. Yeah, I remember having that book. So it was legitimate, right? Because that's what it was worth back in those days. But I'm not even nine years old. I go to my mother in 1970, can I have $400 for a comic book? And that's when I learned my real middle name. For the first time. Jimmy, damn it. <laughs> I always thought my middle name was damn it. And of course, you know, in hindsight, who could have known? But she wasn't going to do that, right? Which is later on why three years later she spent $25 for the Amazing Fantasy 15. But every year when the Overstreet, because actually in 1970, that was the, was that the first year of the Overstreet price guide? For, so there was really no comic price guide value in, in these early days of the collecting business. But then the Overstreet started coming out and every year I would check, see what action comics number one was worth. And I would immediately report this back to mama Cornette. And then I would hear the same thing, Jimmy, damn it. And then when I moved away from home, got in a wrestling business, every year I'd get the Overstreet, I'd call her on the phone. She'd say hello. And the first words out of my mouth were the, figure that a mint copy of Action Comics number one was listed for in the Overstreet comic book price guide. And when it got to, I was emitting a figure that was more than the value of the house she was living in, the damn it got really fucking intense. Jimmy, damn it! I didn't know! <laughs> How could I have known? <laughs> but yeah, but but no, she knew, and, and antiques, she was always big on antiques, because you know, my dad had bought some beautiful stuff when she moved in the house and, and she, you know, we always were flea market people and, and yard sale and puttering around finding knickknacks. So she had to, 
she wasn't an expert uh, on the value of things in different fields, but she knew that if something was old and you collected it, that it should be taken care of and it might be worth something someday. So I never got anything thrown. As a matter of fact, I, I did the, she did the same thing I was talking about on the experience. We must have had one entire U-Haul truck full of bank statements from the 60s and 70s and mail receipts and bills that had been paid and blah, blah, blah. But just in case the documentation was ever needed, it was there. I just checked you were right. The first year of Overstreet was 1970. There you go. Do you think but talking you, about, well, go ahead. What were you going to say? You think it's possible to do something like that for wrestling memorabilia, whether it's programs or posters or cards or various different things. There actually isn't a really good accepted price guide for anything. It's just a, it's the biggest free market out there in the world. The wrestling memorabilia market. Well, I don't think there is. And there, there's a way to do that. And, and here's why. Cause number one, there's, and it took Overstreet years in the comic price guide to document, run down, and list all the obscure publications. And I'm sure there's still some out there that's not listed. And now the type is minute and the fucking thing's a thousand pages. But at least there was some documentation when these things were printed or there's, you know, sales records or the publishers or it. it, it with wrestling, the programs were never listed. Nothing was ever copyrighted. The magazines were that sold on newsstands, but even still then, there's self-published stuff, and it goes back even farther than comic books. The first established comic books in that magazine format were in the early 30s. Wrestling had already been around for decades at that point. And then it, there's also, there's not a giant number of people collecting wrestling memorabilia like there is comic and comic related stuff, both vintage and current. But there are probably more specialists, I would think, in wrestling collectibles as far as people collect this kind of thing only or that kind of thing only or the ring worn stuff or there's so much shit. And so do you, do you want, you know, the genre of the collectible? Do you want ring-worn tights and boots and jackets? Or do you want paper memorabilia? Do you want tickets? Or do you want, there's people with massive photo collections. And what it's worth boils down to the same thing. It's just comics and pop culture mem memorabilia is more organized. But what it's worth boils down to two things. How hard it is to get a hold of or how rare it is and how much somebody wants it. And that's what, you know, there was 30 years ago, there was no conceivable way that Amazing Fantasy 15 would ever sell for as much as Action Comics number one. That's insane because there's very few copies left of Action Comics number one, considering the importance and the demand. But there was certainly more Amazing Fantasy 15s because of the more modernness of it and the fact that, you know, comics were starting to get hot again at that point in time, 62 with Marvel and et cetera, and people, you know, saved them and et cetera. However... Plus, plus 30 years ago, Superman was probably still bigger than Spider-Man. He had a series of movies, the famous TV show. Spider-Man was... Yes. Mostly for comic book fans. But then what happened was it became there's always a turn in the generation and the same thing happens with classic car collectors and everything else where the interest moves to not only what's more familiar to you but what's actually available and i think golden age people there when i was a kid there were people that were trying to put together runs of golden age books and you could kind of still do it but now you can't it'd be ludicrous oh i'm gonna to put together a complete run of captain america golden age from you know number one through whatever number and i'm gonna start now well fuck you right so but then so many spider-man blew up and so many more people want the first spider-man now that the and especially in high grade that the amazing fantasy price blew up 
Whereas people started saying, you know what? I may never get an action number one. And now the big business is only amongst the highest graded copies because everybody else is going to something else that they can buy and it will appreciate in the future to me. But that's just me. You know, there's a book I've been meaning to read. I have it here and I just haven't had the chance yet. And they just profiled the author again on CBS. Uh, I think it was maybe Saturday morning. Have you heard about this book, All of the Marvels? Uh, why have I heard that, but not really? Help me. Douglas Wolk, he read every single Marvel comic ever, up to, you know, whatever certain point the book ends. Right. Read every single Marvel comic, and he puts together the story, because, hold on, let me read from the inside book. The way they put it, <laughs> the way they put it on the show was so interesting. The superhero comic books that Marvel Comics has published since 1961 are, as Douglas Wolk notes, the longest continuous self-contained work of fiction ever created, over half a million pages to date, and still growing. It's really crazy when you think about it. Yeah. And take it as one complete yeah. universe. But there was a break in the 50s. Or elsewise they could have... They could have traced it all the way back to Frank Gotch. Well, I think he actually starts in 62. I don't think he starts like with, I mean, he talks about the early stuff, but I'm not sure if the yeah, universe but, well, he's that's, talking that's what about I'm saying because, because they changed between when the Marvel Golden Age superheroes petered out in the early 50s and they went to romance, westerns, horror comics. Then when they brought the heroes back they made tweaks or changed in the backstory there was a break in the action so to speak it wasn't a continuous narrative did you ever like underground comics like r crumb or anything <laughs> rvp car <laughs> does that mean you never checked them out or you just didn't like them i i would flip through i would see things i would i was i did eh. i like the i like the fucking that was outlaw shit. I, I even then I liked the fucking profession. <laughs> oh come on! You didn't like the outlaw comics? <laughs> no, I didn't like the outlaw. I wanted to see a real superhero. God damn it! Look at the fucking physique on the Submariner. Tell me that, yeah. you know he's not a fucking top guy. He's on that Billy Gunn diet. There you go. See, he still looks good. <laughs> 